Contrary to popular belief, this is not just an American problem. Oh, oh God. <laughs> Where else? Where else? I feel like Poland's very religious. Could they be doing this? She's not a Christian! <laughs> Today's video is brought to you by Speakly, the language learning tool that has everything you need to achieve your New Year's resolutions. Speakly is a language learning tool developed by two polyglots who speak seven languages each, which uh, just makes me feel dumb. <laughs> I speak like one and a bit, and emphasis on the bit. And just seven? I guess it gets easier like after three or four. You're just like, uh, I guess I'm good at this. Uh. <laughs> Their research on thousands of language learners helped them to develop an app and web-based learning tool which can help you learn languages five times faster than through conventional methods. And look, I learned my second bit of second language through conventional methods, and I'll tell you, it took forever. Because it's like, oh yeah, but you don't conjugate the end of the word like this. And it's like, the grammar doesn't work like this, and I'm like, I just want to ask for a beer. I just want to say, oh, I just want a beer. I just want to know how to get to the post office. Come on, I don't need to know how to conjugate the post office. And that's why Speakly exists. You can go from no knowledge to having solid speaking skills in just three to four months with their mobile app. And I, I, I was three to four years of learning. Years! With their mobile apps on iOS and Android, you can learn a new language anytime, anywhere. Learn words based on their relevance in real life situations. Exactly. Look, I don't know post office. Although I am going to the post office this afternoon. I was about to make fun about how I've never asked for directions to the post office. But, because you never go there. But this afternoon I do. But look, it teaches you the stuff you're actually going to use. Which is kind of important, because that's the stuff that you use. You see? It's clever. It's Speakly. Speakly offers a 7-day free trial, and if you join their annual subscription, you'll get a 60% discount. That's bloody good, isn't it? There's a link below. And now today's video. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. As always, I'm your host, Simon. I'm here, one of my writers, Dave. Thank you, Dave. is reading me a script. I'm going to read it. There might be some reactions. Sam's going to edit it. And that's how we roll. It's the things that are no longer taught in school. I wonder if this, like, I feel like the stuff that I've read about so much, like the taste thing, where you have the different, like, zones on your tongue. And I feel like I've made videos about that before, how it's bullshit, but we're all taught it in school. But I don't remember if I was actually taught this in school or if it's just been implanted in my memory or something I was taught because I made so many videos about it. Memory's weird. Anyway, let's just jump in. The education system seems to be constantly under fire from parents who are developing more and more unrealistic expectations of what it means to be a teacher. Anybody who has Facebook will have been subjected to posts moaning about how terrible schools are nowadays and how children are not taught basic life skills that will aid them in the future. Some things within the education system have undoubtedly changed in the 18 years since I left school. I left school in 19... No, <laughs> steady on. 2005, which was... 18 years ago! Dave and I! Ding ding, same age! I feel like I knew that already, maybe. For example, I had a chemistry teacher who, when teaching us about reactive metals, told us that although the school was not allowed to keep cesium on site, it brought some in from home so we could all see what happens when you mix it with water. <laughs> cesium? I don't think... Oh no, maybe we did have cesium. I feel like that was allowed. And I remember... Uh, it sounds like we both had legend chemistry teachers, because I remember our, mine was like... Um, normally you take these little drops of the alkaline metals and you throw them in this little tub of water and it's like... Pssst, and this dude brought in like a f***ing rock of, I have, maybe it was cesium. Lithium, sodium, cesium, rubidium. Rubidium, I'm pretty sure we didn't use that one. That's a big boy, I think that's radioactive. And then there's francium, is francium one? I don't remember the alkali metals, look. I was just I was just watching the metals go fizz fizz. Something I suspect he would not have got away with today. However, aside from not carrying out highly dangerous chemistry experiments, how different is the modern day education? I don't know. I don't know. Actually, my brother-in-law is a chemistry teacher, oddly enough. <laughs> there we go. I'll ask him if he, do, if he brings cesium in. Today we'll find out as we take a look at some of the things uh, that are no longer taught in schools. Why are we still here? Just to suffer. Pluto is a planet. Although many of you may be familiar with the simple mnemonic, my very easy method just speeds up naming planets. We had a different one, like my very something something eat something about something. Um...
although now we have to drop the p off the end because pluto is no longer a planet this popular piece of scholastic gold was relegated to the history books in 2006 when the international astronomical union the iau unceremoniously stripped pluto of its status as a planet purely on the grounds that it wasn't a planet at least not one according to the new classification requirements set forth by the iau in that same year according to these new rules three criteria must be met in order to classify a celestial body as a planet one it must orbit a star two it must have sufficient mass to cause its own gravity to force it into a spherical shape three it must possess sufficient gravity to clear away any other celestial objects in orbit whilst pluto meets the first two criteria it does not meet the third and therefore can no longer be referred to as a planet interest a planet in my heart though i don't remember asking you a goddamn thing Interestingly, this decision caused a tremendous amount of controversy both within the scientific community and from the public at large. Neil deGrasse Tyson, popular celebrity scientist and director of the Hayden Planetarium and the Museum of Natural History in New York. Jesus Christ! Director of the National History Museum in New York. That sounds like a proper, like, full-time job. Is that like a ceremonial title? Because doesn't Neil deGrasse Tyson have, like, TV shows to make and shit? <laughs> What a busy dude. He first noticed Pluto's failings during the 1990s and is believed to have been instrumental in its reclassification. F you, Neil. <laughs> no, I mean, science is science. Um, sorry, Neil. You're cool. It's cool. In an interview with NPR, he stated, other celestial bodies of ice discovered in the outer solar system act similarly to Pluto because they cross orbits with other planets. That's simply not how a large celestial body considered a planet should behave. According to several eminent scientific analysts, this could well be the most hotly debated astrophysics issue that doesn't really matter. However, it has left the teaching staff of the day with the daunting task of coming up with a new mnemonic for teaching the order of the planets. Touch typing. Back in the day, this essential life skill was part of every school's curriculum what i was never taught touch typing at school this wasn't something that was taught you were just expected to know how to type just like you find the buttons on the keyboard and eventually you get good at it and eventually you go from doing this to doing this boom maybe maybe speaking helps you the typist starts with the four fingers of the left hand resting on the letters a s d f yes yes dave we know how to type mate <laughs> and the four fingers of the right hand on the letters j k l and semicolon in this position all of the other letters are easily accessible and with the correct amount of practice it's possible to learn the necessary muscle memory in order to type at exceptional speeds without having to constantly look down at the keyboard to find the letters that you want who looks down at the keyboard my mum looks down at the keyboard she's like she probably doesn't anymore, but I remember she used to. But everyone does this, and then you get good at it. <laughs> Unfortunately, due to the advent of texting and devices with on-screen keyboards, the teaching of this skill in schools has largely fallen by the wayside. Although you might think that due to the aforementioned new technologies, touch typing will soon become as obsolete as writing with a quill, it turns out that this lack of skill really does have a detrimental effect on people's ability to compose quality documents. Touch typing is an example of cognitive automaticity, a process where an individual can carry out a certain task without paying conscious attention to any of the necessary details. Riding a bike and driving a car are also examples of this. What this means in practice is that somebody who can touch type is likely to produce higher quality output than somebody who can't, purely because the touch typist can devote their full attention to what it is they're writing, rather than where to find the question mark or comma. Isn't this- wait, am I so insane? Am I so old that I'm just like, obviously this is something that everyone knows how to do. We don't learn it in school anymore because uh, kids are in front of a keyboard when they're two. Like, my, my kid, she doesn't know how to use a keyboard, but she can fully navigate an iPad. She's three years old. She's just like, bum, 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 I want to watch some YouTube, bum, bum, bum. It's crazy. And I assume, like, when she gets a laptop for the first time, she'll be like, okay, fingers go here, and then you just figure it out. It, that's why it's not being taught anymore, isn't it? It's not because people are just doing it like this. They still have to do, like, work and homework, and, and you're doing that on a phone. I hate when people underestimate my fastness. Although many people argue that text dictation rather than keyboard input is the way forward, this technology also presents certain problems. As anybody who's ever read anything that I've written will tell you, text dictation software is far from perfect. In fact, those last two sentences alone contained four errors that I had to correct, and this interrupts the flow even more than trying to locate keys on a keyboard. Yeah, I've tried the text-to-speech, and sometimes I'll go through phases of it and I'll be like, okay, let's give it another go. And then very quickly I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot about doing that, and it's just easier to type. Type. And also, I just try to write as little as possible because I'm not a writer. And in emails, I'm kind of like, let's just keep it as brief as possible because typing out like sentences. And my my, I don't read, I don't reread things. I'm just like, pa 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 pa. And there's loads of errors. 
but I'm like, it's an email. It's not a formal document. Let's go. Some of you might be reasonably wondering why I just don't touch type, and the answer is that although I can type at phenomenal speeds, my spelling is so atrocious that the resultant document would take several times longer to correct than it actually took to write. Anyway, sorry for the tangent. That is, after all, Simon's job. The point is, damn right. Uh, the point that I was trying to make is that although touch typing has been around for well over a hundred years, there still does not appear to be a better way of writing things down, and the removal of this subject from the curriculum of many schools actually represents a small step backwards in productivity. Again, I'm 90% sure that 99% sure that I was never taught this in school. And Dave and I are the same age, so what's up? 18 years ago. How long did I leave school? 2005. 15, 16, 18 years. Weird. And the UK has like standard curriculums. Like all the schools have to take, teach the same, <laughs> I believe. Latin. Oh my God, I did have Latin though. <laughs> I'm getting old. Until comparatively recently, Latin was a subject that you'd find on the curriculum of many schools. I myself remember actually electing to take Latin as an extra class when I started senior school because I thought that it would be interesting. Like many things that I thought when I started senior school turned out to be wrong. <laughs> I'm not sure if it was the teaching style of the man who came into school, especially to instruct nerds and aspiring historians, who incidentally was so old that it was often suggested that he may have had a hand in the language's inception. <laughs> Yeah, my Latin teacher was also super, super old. He was like, he must have been beyond retirement age. He had like full gray hair. He was an old man. He was like, he, I, I feel like he was older than my grandparents. And my grandparents were retired when I was a kid. Or if it was my English teacher coming to me and suggesting that given how much I struggled with my native language, it might not be the best idea to attempt to start another one. <laughs> My English is <laughs> but I still attempted to start another one. But after only four lessons, I decided Latin was not for me. However, had I been at school 10 or 15 years earlier, dropping the subject would almost certainly not have been an option. Yeah, I didn't, I don't think, I think I took Latin, ooh, I can't remember if I took it in secondary school. It was definitely a mandatory subject in primary school, um, like 9 to 11, I think. And then I think it was probably mandatory for a couple of years at the start of secondary school. Yeah, it must have been mandatory because we didn't get any elective choices at the start. But I'm just trying to remember if I actually took it at secondary school or if it was all primary school, which would be weird because... No, there was definitely Latin at secondary school, I feel. Memory. It's not perfect. Fascinating tangent, Simon. Let's carry on. But is there any benefit to learning Latin in today's modern age? Well, that depends on who you ask. If the sales pitch for Latin courses on the website of the University of Kentucky is believed, studying Latin, a highly organized and logical language, much like studying math, sharpens the mind, cultivates mental alertness, creates keener attention to detail, develops critical thinking, and enhances problem-solving abilities. The Pro-Latin Brigade also claimed that approximately two-thirds of the words in the English language are derived from Latin. Studying it can provide you with an unrivaled understanding of the complexity contained within the English language. Furthermore, anybody who has ever dabbled in either medicine or law will tell you that these two practices still use a lot of Latin terminology. Yeah, I learned more Latin studying law than I did studying Latin, probably, because I was like an adult when I studied law and I was a kid when I studied Latin. One thing I do remember is the teacher would make us greet him at the start of um, Latin lesson with Waleo Magister or something like that, which meant like, greetings, oh master or something like that i don't remember morianus morianus vestris incipiat rem totem et harem facere deberet aristotle it's a widely held view amongst those who are shall we say inclined towards a more skeptical outlook on life that especially in the case of the latter this rigid adherence to a dying language helps to ensure that it remains the workplace of the more classically educated these benefits aside unless you are planning on getting a job working for the vatican it's quite unlikely that being a fluent latin speaker will aid you much in your day-to-day -day life so why has it been dropped from the curriculum funnily enough a word with latin origins from most schools. Well, I asked a friend of mine who is a head teacher at a school in Southampton, and apart from the things that teachers always say, like lack of funding and making way for more relevant things, he raised an interesting point. Latin really is a dying language in the most literal sense, as fewer and fewer people learn it, and more and more people who have learned it die. There will eventually become a point when there is nobody left to teach it. But that's okay, because we have books. It's like it's not like the past, where a language can be completely forgotten. It's like if someone, like, if no one spoke it, and someone wanted to start speaking it, they could. They could look at books and learn how to do it. I didn't. Did, does anyone speak ancient Egyptian? Did they figure that out? I mean, they, I guess they don't know how it sounds, but they know it's a language and they know how it works, right? Or maybe they don't know how it sounds, so it would just be written. You could learn how to write it. But why? 
Wow. Incidentally, there is a very real risk that a similar thing could happen with Braille. Once an essential tool for the blind and the visually impaired, it is being superseded by more technology-based forms of communication. It may currently still have more practical applications than Latin, but it is definitely dying out. <laughs> He's already dead. Darwinism. All right, this one's a little bit divisive. Although Darwinism is still taught almost everywhere, there are a worrying number of schools who teach it alongside creationism and afford it the same level of scientific legitimacy, which blows my <laughs> minds. And you know it's America. <laughs> if you're wondering what that worrying number is, it is some rather than the none that it should be. It is incomprehensible that in 2023, creationism is being taught as scientific fact rather than religious doctrine. In 2004, the school board in Dover, Pennsylvania voted in favor of forcing science teachers to read out the following statement before discussing evolution. It continues to be tested as new evidence is discovered. The theory is not a fact. Gaps in the theory exist for which there is no evidence. Which is fine. It's called science. <laughs> this is what science is about. It's about testing. Yeah, Mr. White. Yes, yeah, science. Okay. The reasoning behind this is that Darwin's theory of evolution was just that, a theory, and as such, it should be treated in exactly the same way as the theory of creationism. Now, that is a, there's a little hole in the, the, the logic there. What the school board failed to take into account was that scientific theory and religious theory are different things. According to Dictionary.com, a scientific theory is, quote, a coherent group of propositions formulated to explain a group of facts or phenomena in the natural world and repeatedly confirmed through experiment or observation. This means that, in in order to obtain the title of theory, something must be able to be extensively tested and conclusively proven. It is not something that was written down hundreds of years ago and simply believed purely on faith. Fortunately, the science teachers were not having any of this, and they released a statement which read in part, quote, If I, as the classroom teacher, read the required statement, my students will inevitably and understandably believe that intelligent design is a valid scientific theory, perhaps on par with the theory of evolution. That is not true. End quote good for you teachers. As an aid to backing up this untruth, the school board helpfully provided a number of copies of a book called Of Pandas and People. The truly mesmerizing work opens with a bastardized quote from Carl Sagan, a scientist who openly questioned the existence of God. Using cut and paste skills reminiscent of those employed by a tabloid newspaper journalist, other writers use Sagan's thought-provoking words to add credibility to their book whilst cutting him off before he manages to make his final religion-questioning point. Ah, Ah, yes. Forgetting context. Brilliant. Well done. You better kneel down and pray to Jimmy with me right frickin' now! What y'all doing? Uh, I'm, we're looking for a booger he dropped. The book goes on to make several other interesting claims, including that giraffes have long necks in order to compensate for their long legs, so uh, they do not die of thirst, and that it is impossible for small dogs to breed with larger ones. <laughs> this is just not true. <laughs> The girls would eventually side with a science teacher, saying that the declaration was unconstitutional and the book could not be used as scientific reference material. I just thought I said, good, I mean good, but really we got there? You might think that this was a win for science, and broadly speaking, it was. However, there is still a great deal of work to be done. A survey conducted by a Pew Forum on religion and public life revealed that 38% of Americans would prefer that creationism was taught in schools instead of, not alongside, but instead of evolution. 38%. 38%. I mean, that's insane. I can't believe 38% of people believe in creationism. I understand that people are religious. There's lots of people who are religious. Most people are religious. I'm not, but I don't like deny the idea that there could be something else out there that we don't understand. I don't think it's through any of the world's religions, but I don't deny that possibility. But to say that we shouldn't teach the science is bizarre because the science is what is going to figure out what is out there. We're not going to find it in a building with a pointy roof. We're going to find it through a laboratory. Contrary to popular belief, this is not just an American problem. Oh, oh God. <laughs> Where else? Where else? I feel like Poland's very religious. Could they be doing this? I do exude a little Christian swag, and I'm proud to be an American. She's not a Christian! <laughs> in January 2001, it was revealed that the Benoist Jerusalem Girls School, an independent faith school in London, was given a statutory notice after continually emitting scientific theories behind the origin of life from its curriculum. Yeah, look, if you're a school, you have to teach what the government say. 
That's how education works. Similar steps were also taken against Lubavitch senior boys' schools in London for teaching creationism in both science and geography. <laughs> Although this entry, you get to university and you're like, you learn something completely different. It's like, no, that's not what I learned. And I'm like, you wasted a lot of time at school, mate, didn't you? <laughs> Although this entry could be described as being slightly clickbaity as evolution still remains on the syllabus by law, the very fact that some schools are still trying to avoid teaching it really does highlight the importance of separating faith from science. Cursive script. Is this joined up handwriting? They're not teaching that anymore. Really? That's a shame. Joined up handwriting? I guess it was quicker back in the day, like because you had to write essays by hand. When you're doing an exam these days, children, do you have to? Do you get to use a computer? Or do you have to write by hand still? Because even when I was at university, we had to write by hand, and it was a pain in the ass. You'd just be like writing for ages. I'd be like, can't we just use a, like a, a type, not a typewriter, but you know, like one of those computers that doesn't connect to the internet or anything? That'd be great. Computer says no. <laughs> when I was at school, it was not uncommon, especially in the early years, to spend at least one hour a week practice, practicing penmanship. In fact, obtaining a so-called pen license, which allowed you to permanently graduate from the use of a pencil, was considered quite the achievement. I don't think I had that. I think there was just an age where they were like, now you use pens. And it's like, okay. <laughs> Sadly, in much the same way as touch typing, this lesson has largely been dropped from the curriculum. Although many of you may remember these hours and hours of practice as simply an exercise in how to endure tedium, it transpires that learning and using cursive script has a number of benefits. Before we get into those benefits, I invite all of you who did in fact find these lessons to be boring or a waste of time to imagine just how much more boring and pointless you may have found it or were you completely unable to see what you were doing. Believe it or not, two of my infant school teachers believed that cursive script was so important that even the blind student needed to learn how to do it if you knew dave is blind that's he's talking about himself just so yeah there clarity although my time was undoubtedly being wasted here are just a few of the reasons that yours was not improving neural connections according to a study carried out by virginia burnage a researcher at the university of washington writing in cursive activated large sections of the brain associated with thinking language and learning memory these brain areas were far less involved if the test subject was printing letters or typing on keyboard increased writing Writing speed, the fluidity of cursive writing is quicker than using printed letters, and this improved speed has been shown to improve concentration and allow the writer to concentrate more fully on the quality of their work. Improved reading ability. It might sound obvious, but in learning to write cursive script, children also learn to read it. As the handwritten word has still many practical applications today, leaving school with the ability to understand many different styles of writing is still beneficial. In addition, studies have shown that children who are well versed in different styles of writing tend to have better literary skills all round. Once again, this former staple of the curriculum is being swept aside in order to make room for other more technologically advanced instruction. So, what does all this really mean? Has the ever-changing school curriculum led to children not learning necessary life skills? Or, as is frequently implied on social media, is school much easier than it used to be? Come on, man! That's too easy. So let's address the second question first. I'm ashamed to admit it, but until fairly recently, I was of the opinion that school was considerably easier than when I used to attend. This naively held belief was stripped away from me very soon after my own child started school. The other day, whilst going through some of his I work with him, I came across references to digraphs, split digraphs, and trigraphs. Oh my god, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> my five-year-old son explained these to me. Oh my god, I googled it several times, but I'm still not entirely sure I know what they are. Either I'm getting more stupid as I age, or school is not getting easier, it's just changing. I sincerely hope for the latter. I'm not looking forward to it. I used to fucking hate. I, some of my most hated childhood memories homework and I'd get home and there was that that feeling that horrible sinking feeling when you're sitting and it was always maths for me where you'd sit in class and the teacher would explain something and you'd be like, oh, I don't really get it. I don't really get it. I don't get it. And then it'd be like, and for homework for tomorrow, you need to do pages 36 and 37 of the, of the textbook. And it would just be a bunch of questions about what we were just taught. And I'm like, uh oh. <laughs> I'm in danger. I don't get it. And then I'd have to go home and try and figure it out. And my dad would try and help me figure it out. And he would be like, it's easy. You just do it like this. And I'd be like, Dad, I don't understand it. And he'd be like, just do it. And I'd be like, oh, God. <laughs> I hated that. And I hate the fact that I'm going to have to do this with my kids someday because it's not fun. It's not nice in any way. And it's useless. Do I need to know how to solve simultaneous equations? No. No, and I never will. In fact, even if I do, I'm not going to do them. I'm going to pay someone to do it for me. <laughs> the time simultaneous equations come up in my life, which will be never. Jesus Christ. And I'll be like, well, you know, it's good to have these math skills. I don't know. Maybe you're running a business. You need to add up numbers. I don't because I have an accountant. Someone who was good at maths at school. That's what I pay them for. I'm good at this shit. 
I was good at drama class. I was actually reasonably good at maths. I did okay at maths. Did I get an A? No, I think I, maybe I did get an A at GCSE. It was either an A or a B. It wasn't an A star. I didn't get any A stars because I'm small brain. And I didn't take it for A level. So maybe I got a B. I can't even remember what grades I got. It was mostly A's and B's. And then I got one C for French. <laughs> Je oui, oui, baguette. Bisous. As for the other question, are children leaving school without important life skills? Maybe. However, it is becoming more and more apparent that teachers are being asked to impart life skills that really should be learned at home. Social skills, the ability to dress themselves, and even toilet training are all things that more and more children are starting school without. <laughs> What? My kid's three. They go to school and they know how to dress themselves, which came after toilet training. They know how to toilet train, although it's not the occasional accident, but it's very rare. Um, these, this, these are shit you have to teach as a parent, like early, before they go to school. Having briefly taught in a school during my early 20s, I know how difficult prioritizing certain aspects of education can be uh, with a number of children starting education without some or all of these abilities. It's little wonder that some useful things are being overlooked. And that's where we end today's video. Thank you for watching. And more.